Welcome to video number 28 in this 30 Days of Taker video series. By God Almighty, almost to the finish line. How about that, huh? Talked about a lot of things spanning <laughs> the, the wide scope and length of Taker's career. And now as we're getting closer to the end of the series, kind of putting the final touches and the final bow on it. Hope you guys have enjoyed this series so far. Got a couple more videos still to come, so I don't bail on it totally. Hopefully for those of you that are checking this out and you've missed some of the other videos, make sure you check out the description box because I've got the playlist link for the 30 Days of Taker video series. You should check it out. Probably a lot of good memories and a lot of good points discussed. But today, I wanted to talk about something big that certainly will evoke some passionate debate, perhaps. Uh, some emotions, sure. Disagreements, absolutely look forward to it. And that is, is The Undertaker the GOAT of WWE? Now when we think about GOAT conversations, and we talk about greatest of all times, in some ways those are incredibly challenging discussions to have. Like when you think about sports, let's say, or even you talk about music and different things. There's just so many different factors. And when you're comparing different eras against each other, it can be really, really tough. You can try and do a better comparison based off of dominance relative to competition and peers during their time frame and then compare that. That, in some ways, is a more effective debate and more effective conversation point for GOAT conversations, but still is not the be-all, end-all. Um, but I think for Taker, it's at least an interesting conversation to have. Because you're talking about a guy that was involved with the company for three decades, who was in a featured prominent role for the better part of three decades. You're talking about a guy who was one of the pillars, one of the building blocks for years of the WrestleMania event. And once the streak really started to become a focus and thing starting around, you know, 2001, 2002, you know, one of the big things that you built your WrestleMania show around was The Undertaker. And it's part of the reason why this company does stadium shows every year now for WrestleMania when they can actually have fans. They don't do the regular arenas. They do stadium shows now. Why? In part because of Taker. But you look at just the body of work. And I certainly think that I'll probably will have a lot of people that won't agree with the assessment. And to be clear, you know, even though I think about it sometimes, it's like, I don't know if I'm fully 100% bought in or believed in either, but I think there is a case to be made, a conversation to be made. Because some people are going to say, well, when you think about WWF or WWE, in no way, shape, or form is Taker the first, second, or even third name that you think of. And that could potentially be true. You know, people are going to think about Hogan. They're going to think about Austin. They're going to think about Rock. And they're going to think about, well, they, I used to watch it back when those guys were around, but I don't anymore. But a lot of those same fans will say, yeah, but I still care about what Taker does, or I would come back and watch Rumble and Mania because I wanted to see what Taker would do. So a lot of older fans, you would sit there and hear that. Um, but you're saying, well, I don't necessarily most closely associate his name with the league. Fair enough. But then I could also say, when you think about the NFL, when you think about dominance relative to competition, dominance of positional group, to this day, Jerry Rice is the unquestioned GOAT in National Football League history. But when you think about the NFL... He's typically not the first, second, third, fourth, or even fifth name that you probably think about of past or present players. But that doesn't mean that he's not the greatest of all time. That's just, it's just one thing. It's just one part. I do think that in order to be in any go conversation, you must absolutely be an icon of what you do. And I think beyond question, with the length of time of relevance, the length of time of his involvement, and what he's done... Taker certainly has achieved icon status in the WWE. Like, people are going to say that Brett or Sean or somebody like that, that those guys are icons. No, they're not icons. Like, icons have to have at least some level of superstar power. They have to have some type of bigger-than-the-sport type of vibe, and Brett and Sean just never had that. That doesn't mean that they weren't stars or that they weren't important guys and characters in the in the scope of WWF slash E history, but you know, icons are guys like Hogan and Andre 
and Macho Man and Austin and Rock. Those are icons. Vince McMahon is an icon. I would argue The Undertaker is also an icon. And now you're going to have those fans that are going to argue that, well, he can't be because he wasn't the biggest guy in his own era. And you had guys like Hogan were on top, and then Bret and Shawn were on top, and then Austin and Rock were on top, and then later on it's Cena, Batista, Orton were on top. You know, but some of that can also be by design. Like, Taker was not exactly the type of character that you would want to incredibly overexpose all the time by always putting the championship on him. So in some ways, it was a victim of the success and the importance of the character that he didn't get nearly as many world title runs as he did, or he wasn't featured quite as strongly at times as some other guys were. He wasn't forced as much down people's throats as some other guys were. Um, but he's the guy, when you talk about these different guys, yeah, but when Hogan's and Savage's and Andre's of the world were gone, Taker was still there. When Brett and Sean were gone, Taker was still there. When Austin and Rock were gone, Taker was still there. When Cena and Batista and gone and Orton's only kind of there, Taker still at least somewhat there. Like, that three decades, you know, that means a lot. And when you think about, you're going to say drawing power. Well, he didn't have Austin or Rock's drawing power. Like, let's be clear. Austin at his absolute best was absolutely white hot. He absolutely was. But it is a Meltzer fallacy to say that he's the biggest superstar in the history of professional wrestling or even in the history of WWF slash E. Like, that's just dumb. That's just not backed by any factual evidence. Austin was a megastar. No question about it. Became a household name. But he was so great that when he was out with the injuries... Rock and Triple H were kind of on top running the show in 2000, and ratings were better than ever. Business was as good, if not better, than ever. So what the hell does that say for Austin? And even when you look at a guy like Austin, you say, for all intents and purposes, his true run at the top only equated to three, maybe four years at the very most. And when you think about The Rock, you're going to say, well, there, clearly, he's a bigger star. He's got to be the go. Again, when you talk about Rock, you know, for all intents and purposes, his top run was from end of 98, middle 98, you know, in the build-up to Survivor Series 98, to 02 to 03. So maybe, again, you're talking about four or five years, and even then you had still had some breaks in there for him to film movies. And you could certainly argue that as great as The Rock was and as much of a star as he truly was and is, he's even more well-known now as a movie star a box office attraction that also used to be a top wrestling dude. He's remembered as, I used to watch wrestling back when he did it, but now I just watch him in the movies. Like, The Rock is more closely associated with movies than he is the WWE. You know, so if I looked at it, the, probably to me, when you think about the GOAT conversations, you could talk about longevity, you could talk about impact, you can talk about importance, you could talk about... You know, the money drawn, all those things are there. The, the pure talents themselves, like how much do they stand out about the crowd? Like you factor in character, charisma, mic work, ability to tell stories, in-ring performance, like all those things. So many things come into play for sure. But when I look at guys like Austin and The Rock, yeah, they're white hot. was certainly way white hotter than any point in time in Taker's career. But Taker was the guy that you drew a consistent amount of money with for a consistent amount of time who was doing that before Austin and Rock peaked and doing it well after Austin and Rock left. And when I'm thinking about GOAT conversations, you got to have more than five, four or five years of true top flight run to me to be classified as GOAT, which brings you to somebody like Hogan. Now, this is the one to me. Like, if you're talking completely unbiased and you're just dealing with the history, you're just dealing with facts, when you're just dealing with, you know, wrestling itself, sports entertainment itself, like, that's the one, to me, that's the toughest. You could also say Andre, but when I'm saying WWF slash E, I'm thinking about it more since Vince McMahon Jr. owned it. And Andre certainly was a significant player for this company and incredibly vital and important uh, to the success of this company to this day. But for all intents and purposes, his top run under Vince Jr. with the company was an off and on five, six year stretch. 
know, before his body really started breaking down and deteriorating, he just couldn't physically do much anymore. But that doesn't change the fact that, you know, the most watched wrestling match of all time still to this day <laughs> is Hogan and Andre, that main event in February of 88, 33 million viewers. And the only time that Hogan and Andre do massive numbers on a Saturday night's main event or a main event show. Um, you know, but when you think about impact, and you look at scope and you look at how they changed the business, how they changed the company, what they meant to the company, like Hogan's the one. You cannot like him for being a unapologetic racist or an insensitive racist, as you should. That unfortunately, similar to like OJ Simpson, you know, allegedly killing Ron, <laughs> Ron Goldman and Nicole Ron Simpson. You know, you could not like him for that, but it doesn't change just how great of a running back he was in the 1970s. It can't change that. Like, you can divorce the two. It's a shame that you can't just talk about the great football player, O.J. Simpson, and the guy that became a big time, you know, kind of crossover mainstream star um, without then talking about da, 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 da. And, you know, unfortunately with Hogan. It's all this stuff in terms of wrestling and all the impact and all the money that he made, just how big of a star he became. And then there's that, a bit of a dot, 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 dot. But in terms of this company, you're talking about a guy that was there for the first nine WrestleManias. Like, WrestleMania may not be around, may not have worked. The company may not be around if it wasn't for Hogan. Like, Hogan's the one that changed the game. Hogan's the one that... Because of his star power, when Vince run in other territories, it put other territories out of business. It was Hogan that people wanted to come to New York to work with. It was Hogan was the guy that you built the early WrestleManias off of the back of. It's Hogan, obviously, along with Andre, is why Survivor Series came into be. And the Royal Rumble, in a way, came to be. The SummerSlam became to be. It was all built off of the backs of Hogan in a lot of ways. So you're thinking about, shit, guy that was a megastar for many years, household name still to this day. Everybody knows who Hulk Hogan is. Everybody knows him as a professional wrestler. Like, that's hard to overcome. Like, still Taker had a much longer career and certainly notable and certainly significant. And I could sit there and counter with, you know, there are other things beyond just the true star power. There's also the thing of how much money did you not just make yourself, but how much money did you make for the company, but also for other people? You know, and Hogan was the type of guy, as were others, such as Austin and so forth, where, you know, it is what it is. It's a circumstance of reality. Now, I can't blame him, frankly, is I'm the top guy. You can, I want to work with people to draw the most money but we're not going to hurt the golden goose. I get that. Whereas Taker would be a guy, I want to work with them. I want to pick them. I want to work with them because it is going to help me. It's going to make me more money. It's going to make me look good. But I also want to make them look good. I also want to help make them. I also want to help elevate them. And when you look at the roster for WWE over the past two decades, you look at time after time, a lot of people that worked with Taker that were better off because they worked with Taker. And you can't really say that with Hogan or Austin or even Rock. Like, there, there is a, you have to think bigger picture, but when you think the bigger picture, you could kind of make that argument and say, yes, he was never as white hot as some of these other guys. He was never truly, you know, the megastar that some of these other guys. But again, some of that was by design to protect the character. Like, maybe thinking of Taker as the goat of WWE is more of a respect-based thing, just because of how long he was there, the loyalty that he had, he didn't pick up his bow and go home. He didn't leave to go to Hollywood. He didn't leave to go to WCW. You know, he didn't do any of that stuff. So, you know, for me, sometimes I might refer to Taker as the go-to WWE and not even necessarily fully, truly mean it because I think it is Hogan, personally. But I do it more so out of a respect to the man and the career and the accomplishments. Because I think beyond question. Taker is as important as so many of those guys. I really, really do. Because of the longevity, because of who he worked with, because of who he helped elevate, because of who he helped make better, because he was that leader, he was that bedrock, that foundation piece for so damn long. Um, but I want to know from you, do you think The Undertaker is the GOAT 
of WWE. If not, why not? And if you don't think it's him, then who is it? And I can't wait for the Austinites to come into my comment section with their flaming keyboard singles of fire. I look forward to it, all you Meltzer marks. Let's have some fun with it and be nice to each other if we can. But as much as I would like to say that Taker is truly the GOAT, I sometimes might refer to him because of a respect factor. But I'm sorry, I, I can't. I can't. No. <laughs> I can hate the man, but also respect the impact. And when it comes to Hogan, you absolutely can hate the man and what he represents in those ways and also acknowledge the impact that he has because nobody in the history of that company not named Vince McMahon or maybe Andre the Giant um, can say that they meant as much to that company as Hulk Hogan.